we have Dr. Darren Farber speaking to us about developmental delay. Dr. Farber is a child neurologist with the Norton Children's Neuroscience Institute and an associate professor at the U of L School of Medicine. He joined the um, faculty in 2007 after completing his child neurology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic and has been instrumental um, in building our division of child neurology here over the last 10 years. He has a multitude of clinical interests, um, is the co-director of the University of, Lure Neuro University of Louisville Neurogenetics Clinic and a founding member of the Comprehensive Neuro-Oncology Clinic. So thank you, Dr. Farber. You're welcome. Um... I'm assuming everybody can hear and see me. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic approach to a child with a developmental disorder. And uh, I plan to talk about the main developmental categories and disabilities we see in children, to talk about the screening and surveillance assessments, review aspects of our eval, talk about some of the diagnostic and testing options we have and management for these patients as well. Developmental delay is probably the second most common referral to child neurology after seizures. It's an extremely common uh, issue in the pediatric population affecting about 15, 20% of children in the country. And, and there is enormous, and there's a, just a huge uh, impact on these children with regards to their family, to their community, to their school, to in their, their in society in general. And uh, it's important to identify and screen for these children because we clearly know that earlier recognition and earlier intervention leads to significantly greater gains later in life compared to children who are identified at a much later age. So why do we do developmental screening? Well, there are many very well-validated screenings available to evaluate these children. Again, we have better outcomes for these children in terms of their higher graduation rates, delayed pregnancy, increased employment, decreased criminality. Um, in addition, subjective impressions of development by parents are oftentimes inaccurate. Parents may think their children are very delayed when they're not, or they may think they're doing fine when they in fact have significant delays. And again, the opportunity to avert these kind of maladaptive secondary outcomes such as self-esteem, self-confidence, mood issues, um, things like that. And, and in general, as we all know that the first three years of life are the critical times in neurodevelopment. It's when our brain is most plastic, it's most adaptable. Um, and again, early intervention, early treatment is much more effective compared to later treatment for these children. I also want to talk about uh, definitions. I feel a lot of times we use the incorrect vocabulary when thinking about these children, in particular in terms of developmental delay and developmental uh, disability, because oftentimes people think they're the same thing, but in fact, they mean different, they mean different things, that children can be developmentally delayed and they can outgrow or catch up those delays later on in childhood and be in the quote unquote normal range, while children who have a developmental disability, that is typically a lifelong issue, would be a chronic lifelong throughout their life. And while these children can make improvements and thrive with therapies intervention, they again will have a lifelong intellectual um, uh, disability to some sort. Other definitions we think about are surveillance, the process of recognizing children who may be at risk, screening, using standardized tools to identify these children, and then our evaluation, which is really a, a complex process aimed at more clearly identifying those children and their developmental, their specific developmental disorder. So neurodevelopmental disabilities are chronic, potentially lifelong disorders. And these are etiological heterogeneous. They could be to prematurity or meningitis or malformation brain development or a genetic uh, abnormality. But the primary feature for a child with a, 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 a neurodevelopmental disability will be delays with regards to one of the main five domains. And that'd be motor, either gross or fine motor, uh, speech or language skills, social, cognitive, and their ADLs. And, and the main categories that we think about when we see children in our clinic who have a developmental delay is that they could have a 
global delay, a gross motor delay, a cerebral palsy, or a developmental language disorder, a learning disability, or autism. And we'll go into these categories each individually. When we say that a child has a global developmental delay, what that really means is that they have delays and significant delays, typically two or more standard deviations in two or more of those developmental domains. So two or more of these five domains, motor, speech, social kind of ADLs, there's two or more of those domains are affected. Oftentimes they're all affected. And we typically use the term a global developmental delay to refer to a child who's less than five years of age versus an intellectual ability where this is, tends to be a child with a below average IQ, so an IQ less than 70, and that usually you think of a term for a child who's greater than five years of age. We don't use the term MR anymore, so that's a non-PC term, so instead we'll say a child has an intellectual or developmental disability. Or we, I often see children who have gross motor delays. And this is a delay in their development of their motor skills, usually involves both fine and their gross motor skills, but their other domains tend to be in the normal range. So they have normal cognition and they have normal language skills and no normal social skills for their age. Um, we see many children in our clinic who have cerebral palsy. And when we say a child has cerebral palsy, it means a couple you know, CP is a term that has a lot of kind of baggage with parents. And um, I spend a lot of time uh, describing what CP means. Uh, sometimes we see parents and their child have delays and they've known that their whole life. And then we tell them they have cerebral palsy and they're very upset by that diagnosis. And when we say a child has CP in clinic, what that means is that the child has a static motor encephalopathy. And what that entails is that typically that there is an injury that occurred to the central nervous system early in brain development. So either prenatal, perinatal, postnatal, and that injury is not a progressive problem. It doesn't get worse as they get older, but because of that injury, it has to affect the motor system. Motor means balance, strength, coordination, tone. Um, some of the uh, exam findings we can see will be issues with hypertonicity, they're weak, their muscle bulk may be atrophied, their reflexes may be abnormal, they have abnormal gaits, and it can be associated with intellectual delays, can be associated with seizures, but to have a diagnosis of CP, those are not necessary. And CP is also a descriptive, not an etiological diagnosis. You can see P again due to prematurity or a stroke or meningitis or hypoxic brain injury. It just describes basically what we see when we examine a patient and go over their history. Very commonly as well, I see children with developmental language disorders or an isolated speech delay in which there's delayed acquisition of language comprehension and expression, but they tend to have normal cognitive function, and there's a discrepancy between their language and their nonverbal skills. And also, in order to have this, they cannot have, such as cannot have hearing loss, cannot have a global delay, and can't have autistic type features. And more and more commonly now, I'm seeing children referred to neurology for learning disabilities. It's not typically what we think of as a neurologic disorder, but I'm, I see very frequent referrals now for us to evaluate these children. And when we say a child has a learning disability, what that entails is that there's delayed academic achievement in relation to their potential uh, ability based on what their intellectual functioning is. These children tend to have a normal intellect. Of note as well that ADHD is not a learning disability. Oftentimes families feel it is. Now it certainly can't interfere with their learning and it's in present about a third of children who have a learning disability, but ADHD in particular in itself is not considered a learning disability. And these children, again, because since they have normal intellect by receiving appropriate therapies and services and tutoring and having educational program in place, they can overcome and they can uh, navigate around their learning challenges. And these can range in severity, but they typically involve four types. They, we see um, uh, issues with oral language, so listening, speaking, understanding. We see issues with reading and their comprehension and decoding. 
which is probably the most common. We see issues with written language and spelling, and we see uh, issues with mathematics and computational and problem solving. And uh, you know, autism is a whole lecture into itself, but when we say a child has an ASD related disorder, they have a delay in their language and their social development, typically at an onset less than two and a half to three years of age. And there also can be very significant behavioral disturbance in these children. They're very regimented. They have a lot of OC tendencies. They have frequent stereotypes like Dr. Barton showed earlier today. Um, those commonly occur as well with ASD. So the, the process of evaluation for these children, I, I think it involves three main aspects. It involves the screening, surveillance, and their diagnostic assessment when we're evaluating a child for a developmental delay. And the screening is a process of identifying children who may need a more comprehensive developmental eval. And this consists of a brief assessment to ID those children who need more intensive diagnosis and more intensive assessment. And this can be uh, accomplished through the very commonly available scales we have, such as the Denver or the Bailey scales to kind of screen for these children. Versus the surveillance process in which we're continuously observing and following children over time to assess for delays in their developmental course. And this consists of you know, listening to their parents, hearing their concerns, reviewing their developmental history and getting a thorough history in terms of where they've been tracking over time as well observing the child in your office and it's kind of seeing if their behavior, if their skills seem to be age appropriate, as well as then if needed, which we'll discuss later, referring children to further developmental assessments, considering therapies or uh, for their delays, hearing tests for concerns of language. And, and with regards to surveillance that uh, sometimes we think we know best, but it's, it's very important to listen to parents' concerns. They're usually right. It's been shown that about 70% of times, that the time the parents voice a developmental concern, that that concern is substantiated. There is an issue with their motor or language developments. And oftentimes there's also a significant discrepancy between when their concern is first noted and when they're eventually referred to a specialist for, for additional assessment and evaluation. So we've seen a child who we have concerns for a developmental problem. We're considering um, involving the team to get assessment who, who is involved in that team. So that would be psychology, educator, social work, perhaps developmental pediatrician, a geneticist perhaps, and of course, neurology. And, and the aspects of these eval when a child is referred to us for an assessment, of course, is the basics, is the history, our exam, any need for possible testing, and then referrals to any appropriate ther um, therapist or other subspecialists. When, when I see these children in clinic and we're going over the history, the aspects that I tend to focus on in terms of their family history, are there neurologic disorders? Is there consanguinity, which is much more common than you think and at all times is a difficult conversation approach, but uh, we have to ask that question. We go over their pregnancy and birth history, was there IGR, was there drug exposure? Again, very, unfortunately very common in our area, lots of drug exposure, was there infections, was the child born preterm, was it C-section, what was the birth weight, how did the post course go, was there seizures, feeding issues, body temperature issues, was there encephalopathy, uh, things like that we'll wanna focus on. More specifically, when I'm seeing these children in clinic and I'm going over their developmental history, uh, the first thing I want to know is the age at when the parents first noted concerns for their children's development. I want to know, again, which domains, is it more of a motor issue, more of a speech, more of a social, is it more ADL, is it more of a global process? Um, how have they progressed in their domains over time? How is their play skills? How is their socialization skills? And importantly, is there any concerns for developmental regression? So we've seen regression or loss of previous acquired milestones that suggest there's an underlying degenerative process here going on, whether it's genetic or epileptic or something like that, perhaps. And, and the kind of key pearls, I think, when I see these children and I'm doing their examination is we want to keep the children in close proximity to their parents. Oftentimes, they're nervous when they're seeing us. 
We leave the more intrusive, the more hands-on aspects of the exam until the end, such as the fundoscopic exam or the pupillary light reflex or checking their reflexes, things like that. I pay close attention to their head circumference. Oftentimes, I measure the parent's head circumference as well. We'll look for any dysmorphic features, such as a possible genetic process. Look at their parents. We feel the children are dysmorphic. Um, we'll look for any birthmarks. We'll look at their spine, look for signs of a dimple or scoliosis. Um, I'll also look at how they interact with their parents. Are they expressing appropriate stranger anxiety? Are they comforted by their parents? Are they not making eye contact? I'm going to look at their vocabulary for their age. Do they have appropriate strength and structure? If sometimes children won't talk to us, but they'll file commands, will they identify body parts or colors, things like that. We'll look to see if we can assess their visual assessment. Do they hold objects close to their face? Are they not visually fixating? On their motor exam, again, we'll look for any specific focal findings with regards to tone or strength, look for abnormal movements, look at their coordination and motor planning in general, and of course, their gait and their balance and their running. I oftentimes do my examinations in the hallway just because you have more space and you want them to run and move around and feel more comfortable. And, and this is, I think, the part really when when it comes, when why children are, are sent to us, right? So a child's been screened by their parents, their pediatrician, we have concerns for developmental issue, they're, they're sent to neurology, we performed a history and examination. And then the main question I think for us is, is there any neurodiagnostic test that should be performed to see if we can figure out an etiology for their developmental concerns? And the questions that I think about before I order a diagnostic test is, does this child have a static or progressive disorder? Has the child always been delayed about the same degree? Are their delays becoming worse as they're becoming older? What type of development does this child have? Does this child have more of a motor issue, more of a language issue, more of a social issue, more of just a global delay in general? What is this current child's current level in relation to their chronological age? Are they six months behind from their chronological age? Are they two years behind? If I think there's perhaps a an injury that occurred, when did it occur? Was it you know, a prenatal issue? Was there a patient IUGR? Was there a very difficult delivery? Were there postnatal complications? Or is there likely is there likely underlying etiology? Do I think the child has a structural problem or a genetic process or a birth-related complication? And then what will be this child's needs for in order to kind of rehabilitate and give them therapy for their current developmental needs? So um, what to do? Because we can order lots of tests. I can order imaging and genetic testing and lots of EEGs, and I can't do everything in every patient, right? That'd be wasteful and inappropriate. So testing, I tell the residents, testing should be selective and rational. Testing should be performed based on what the child's exam and history tell you and what testing may, and, and how the testing may answer the questions we have. So in terms of the testing that we can do, which I do a lot of as part of our neurogenetics clinic and doing a lot of developed neurology in general is that we can order genetic testing that can include a microarray or a CGH, which is sort of like our first line uh, genetic screening evaluation. We can order fraudulent testing, child has autistic features. We can order targeted gene panels, whether the child has more of a seizure issue or more of a, a taxi concern or more of an intellectual disability. We have genes targeted for those specific kinds of issues. Or if we're unsure, we can just sequence the entire genome and get whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Or we can get neurophysiological testing. We can get EEGs, either routine or prolonged monitoring if we have concerns for a child having seizures. Or if we have concerns more of a peripheral process, we'll get a nerve conduction or EMG. Or we can do evoke potentials, which are not done too frequently. Mostly they're done in peds for uh, brain some auditory evoke responses to assess children's hearing. We can get uh, neuroimaging, of course, right? So we order lots of MRIs to get look for the brain, look for any signs of structural abnormalities or prior injury. We can get CTs, we can obtain ultrasounds. Um, and of course, we involve our 
associated specialty services. So if I have concerns for a genetic process, we'll include genetics for dysmorphology assessment, second opinion for genetic testing, or we have concerns for hearing and language delays, we can refer to audiology. Oftentimes there are a number of social issues with regards to you know, financial, uh, having insurance, um, transportation issues, getting onto waivers, and social services are very helpful in that. If we have concerns for you know visual issue or motor planning or uh, things like that, we'll have ophthalmology assess our patients. Oftentimes, there are significant neuropsychiatric associations with children with developmental issues, so we'll involve our psychology and our psychology colleagues, as well as PM&R and orthopedics if we feel children need rehab services, they want to get OT or ST or PT or visual therapies or feeding therapies. PM&R are very helpful to facilitate that and have those sorts of assessments as well performed. Um, I felt it'd be helpful just to give some general recommendations for how we practice in terms of when we eval children who had developmental delays. And one that actually I just missed two weeks ago as a look for lead, especially with children that are, have risk factors or an endemic area. I saw children two, child two weeks ago who had lead toxicity was caused developmental delays. And I didn't really get a good history and dig through their EMR and I ordered unnecessary testing. So lead certainly is uh, an issue in many parts of Louisville, especially in the more urban areas. Again, if a child has delay, especially if they're dysmorphic, we'll want to obtain genetic testing. Usually if a child has more than two dysmorphisms and an intellectual delay, we should always consider obtaining a microarray or CGH. Brain MRIs, again, if we have concerns for structural problems or prematurity or uh, hypoxic brain injury. Again, if there's language delays, we're gonna to to have to check their hearing. With regards to EEG, typically it's not a recommendation first test for first line test for delays, but if we have concern for seizures, then yes, we should check one absolutely. In terms of children who have language delays, we're gonna to wanna to screen for autism, screen their hearing, and again, check an EEG if we have a concern for language regression. If we think a child has perhaps a motor delay more due to a peripheral process, not a central process, then we'll want to check perhaps check a CK level to look for myopathy. We'll want to obtain EMG and nerve conduction study, and perhaps as well targeted genetic testing to look for any uh, genetic etiology for a neuromuscle problem as well. Um, I thought it'd be important to mention the diagnostic yields, and these numbers are, are a bit old, and I think they're perhaps a bit better now, but in terms of the yields, they can vary quite a bit. So typically, if a child has CP, our testing is quite good, and we can find an etiology more than 90% of the time. Children who have global delays, about two-thirds time we can find an etiology. Children with motor delays, it's about half, but then our numbers go down quite a bit in terms of the yield for children who have autism spectrum disorders or isolated language disorders. And why do we bother with all this testing? Why do we do this screening? Why do we uh, obtain all this testing? Well, I think a lot of times it is very helpful for starters. We kind of give the family this sense of closure, knowing why their child has a developmental delay. It can help a prognostication for the child. It, it ends their diagnostic journey of having test, test after test after test. Sometimes the children are found to have a specific uh, disorder. It can be associated with renal issues or hepatic issues. We know to screen for those. If there's concern for a genetic issue, then again, it may help the parents with their family planning, affect their recurrence risk as well. And then, and then my last slide that in addition to doing all of our testing and doing referrals and to find a diagnostic etiology, I find that as time goes on, when I see children who have a developmental delay, oftentimes they just want a little bit of TLC. They want to talk about their child. They want encouragement. They want to make sure they did nothing wrong. They don't want to have guilt. Um, oftentimes we discuss short-term goals. And when I see a, a five-year-old, we don't talk about when they'll be 15. We talk about what would be when they're six, where it'd be kind of more of a short-term horizon and not so much of a long-term horizon. And, and those, that's, that's in a nutshell, that's sort of our, our approach to children with a developmental um, issue. Uh, we have a few minutes left to have to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Farber. Um, so yes, please enter any questions in the Q&A. Um, I had a couple questions for you, Dr. Farber. One is um, how, if at all, does your approach to a child with um, global developmental delay differ from a child who's presenting 
with kind of typical features of autism. Um, does that sort of change the way that you look at the patient? Do you um, take different initial diagnostic steps or, or is, it, is that kind of a similar process for you? I see, that's a good question. Well, in a global delay, oftentimes there'll also be a motor involvement as well. Oftentimes there are some similar etiologies. Children can have a structural brain malformation or a genetic abnormality, which can present both autism and global delays. They're typically in autism, they oftentimes will have normal motor development. Um, so their presentation can be a bit different, but there is some overlap in our diagnostic testing. Yeah. And then, that's, uh, oh. you know, that was a really uh, uh, good question. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, autism really is uh, not a single disorder, you know, and uh, so that I think you have to look at these patients in a, in much the way that you would like to, you would look at a child with developmental delay, which is, which means that you know, what is the extent of your delay, what combination of delay you have, what is the etiology and things like that, because, you know, some kids who may look mildly autistic initially may actually have a underlying progressive encephalopathy of some sort, uh, you know, and so I've seen all kinds of combination of things. And so I think they have to be looked very much in a similar manner in terms of, you know, what is exactly the nature of your delay and what is the etiology of your delay? What is your prognosis? What is your diagnostic testing? So I think that that's a really uh, good uh, you know, question. And then another question I had is what, do you have sort of a threshold for moving on to a next level of genetic testing like whole exome or whole genome if you know, the initial brain MRI, Fragile X, CGH is all normal. Um, is, is that something, you know, do you have kind of a specific algorithm for moving on to that or is it kind of just a case by case basis? Sure, sure. So I think I think the question that we often ask ourselves is, you know, we've done a microarray, we've done a Fragile X, should we attain a, a targeted gene panel for autism or intellectual delays or should you go straight to a whole genome? Um, and I think that's a question where you still have a difference of opinion. Um, generally speaking, if our concern is purely just an intellectual delay or autism, there's not other like motor issues, there's not other features going on, the child's not ataxic, things like that, we'll still probably prefer to go to intellectual disability gene panel versus a whole genome or whole exome. 